Good morning and happy Sabbath, Oceanside Church family. So happy that you are with us uh, live. A couple of quick announcements before we move on. Our first ever virtual VBS program is going to start tomorrow, starting Monday, and we'll go all the way till Friday. We have a Kinder VBS that starts at 5 to goes till 5.30 p.m., and then a regular VBS that starts at 6 and goes till 7 p.m. The links to both those uh, experiences are going to be in our Oceanside YouTube channel. So please feel free to access those things. We will actually send you a newsletter with, uh, with the links to where you can watch those. So again, they start tomorrow. If you have already registered for the VBS by emailing the church, you can actually pick up the supplies uh, on two days. So you can either pick it up on Sunday, this coming Sunday, which is tomorrow, uh, from 9.30 till 1.30, we will be set up in the parking lot, Sunday at 9.30 a.m. till 1.30 p.m. And then also Monday from 9.30 a.m. till 1.30 p.m. as well. So anytime during those time blocks, please come and pick up your supplies if uh, you have already registered for the VBS. As many of you know, the COVID-19 cases are up and things are not looking great on that front, but we can still pray for God to be with our health workers. Let's pray that God's going to be with our families. I believe we can be Christians and also be good citizens of our nation. So in that spirit, let's do the best we can. Let's do all we can to make sure that not just our family, but other families are safe and healthy as well. Let's worship our God. We have a lot to be thankful for, even in the midst of this crisis. Let's tune our hearts, tune our minds to the frequency of His voice and worship Him with gladness.
morning, church family. I'm so happy to be able to pray with you this morning. Please bow your head with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for our friends and our families who remind us of how much you love us every day. These are some difficult times for us, Lord. For some of us, it's been difficult for a long time. But today, we don't have to worry. Today, we can rest. This is because you're the God of miracles. All we have to do is to ask you and trust you. We have a list of names that we'd especially like to raise to you, Lord. The Agolia family, Alicia Baker, Halia Buick, Jonathan Chung, Teresa's family, which is Amy Anger's friend, Richard and Marilyn Maxwell, Bill Hade, Tapa'u family, the Chinle Seventh-day Adventist Church, our pastors, our community leaders, medical workers, and everybody in harm's way. We also ask you to be with each and every one of us who have some sort of pain. We ask you for healing and love and peace, Lord. You are our lifeline. You saved us one day and you keep saving us every single day. We give you our hearts, Lord, and we love you. In the name of Jesus, amen. your hands up high, open, shut them, open, shut them, give them your heart, open, shut them, open, shut them, fold them in your lap. Nearly 70 years ago, in Kansas City, a man named Omar was working at his Dairy Queen. Now, one hot day, his soda machines quit working. He didn't quite know what to do, but he thought, well, maybe I'll save the soda and get it a little colder so he put it in the freezer. Now, that was a good choice. People came to get it, and he had colder drinks for them. But as the day wore on, when people got the, the um, ice-cold soda, it was something different. It was full of ice crystals, kind of like a slushy, and he started serving that. Everyone loved it. And as the days went by, people would say, I want that drink that's been in the freezer a little longer. He figured that this was a good thing. So he started tinkering in his garage and he used a car air conditioner and an old ice cream maker. And he came up with a machine to make this cold, cold drink. So he put it out in the stores and everybody thought it was a great idea. Someone bought the patent and called it the Icy. But it wasn't too long after that before people noticed it all over. And a store called 7-Eleven, a convenience store, came calling. They said, we'd like to buy your icy. So they did. They had to call it a different name. They held a contest and called it Slurpee for the noise it makes when you get down to the bottom and you can't quite get it all up in until you slurp it up. Everyone thought it was wonderful. It was known as the coldest drink around. Now, have you ever had a good cold drink? They're really good. But sometimes when you drink a cold drink, you get something called phenopalatine ganglioneuralgia. That means your head hurts. If that happens, you drink something warm or put your tongue to the roof of your mouth and it will warm it up and then the headache will go away. Not fun, but it sure is fun to have cold drinks. Now, 7-Eleven had pretty good success with the Slurpee. They had even more success because it was thought of as a children's drink. A little bit later, they ran a campaign ad, and they called it Stranger Things. One of the ads had a man who said, I'm just an ordinary man, and then he drank up a Slurpee. He became a jet pilot. So soon, all kinds of people started buying it. But they used to sell about 50 cups a day, but it went to 300 cups a day. Now, there's even a dance called Dance the Slurp. I've never seen it, but you might have. You might like to dance it. Now, 
when there was a problem getting those little things out, the little glass little bit at the end of the cup, a man noticed that. He said, well, I'm going to take care of that. And he invented the spoon straw. Have you seen the straw with the little spoon at the end? It was invented just for the Slurpee. The place that sells the most Slurpees in the U.S. is in Washington State. In uh, North America, it's in Manitoba. Uh, that's in Canada. Now, there's all kinds of flavors. There's Dr. Pepper, raspberry, blueberry. There's watermelon, sour patch watermelon. There's all kinds of names for the flavors that you can, have, you can enjoy at the Slurpee Bar. Now, every year, 7-Eleven, on 7-Eleven, so July 11, lets you get a free drink. It's now limited how much you can get. But it used to be you could bring in your own container and get a drink. People brought in fish bowls, big pots, big pans, big bowls. One person brought in a child's swimming pool. I think that's when the law changed and they said, no, you have to have a cup. Slurpees are fun, cold drinks. Maybe you'll have one. No, we need to drink things when it's warm. We need water, especially. Did you know you can't live without water? You really do need water every day, lots of it. Did you know Jesus did something else? He said, you can't live without me because I'm living water. I help you all the way. My living water is food for your heart, your soul, your brain, your spirit, everything. And he has it for us. You don't have to go to 7-Eleven. You don't have to get that brain freeze. You just say, Jesus, I'd like to have your living water because I know that means that you love me. Have a great week. Bye. Well, here we go again. And actually, this Sabbath, we're also doing a live face-to-face uh, -face, uh, church service out on the grassy lot outdoors. And uh, I'm hoping that we can keep that up. Um, I do not want to fall into a habit of, uh, well, we're going to watch uh, church on TV. We need to be together as a church family. Uh, that's where our strength lies, but uh, we'll see how it goes. And whatever we do in meeting face to face, we're going to make sure that everybody's safe. So that's starting here uh, this Sabbath. And uh, let's be praying for this church family. So I'd like to get you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 14. Book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 14. This little section in the Bible is one of the precious gems. It's one of the best little pieces of Scripture that we have. I love it. And uh, here are the disciples. And they have seen Jesus crucified. Huh. They have also seen him having risen from the dead. And they've been up in Galilee. And they have seen him rising up into his heaven. Come on, his feet coming off the ground. And up he goes, disappearing from their sight and up into the clouds, going back to heaven. And now they are back down in Jerusalem, just like Jesus told them to be. And they are waiting for the Holy Spirit. In Jerusalem, there's going to be enemies all around. The Pharisees are still marching up and down the streets with scowls on their face. Uh, and the Christian people, the believers, the disciples, they're going to be hiding out in houses. They're going to be in probably the house of John Mark. They will be in maybe that upper room in the house of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. They will be all scattered out through Jerusalem. But will they be afraid? Will they be lonely? The answer to that is no, they will not because they are always constantly now in prayer praying for each other in here uh, the the uh, in the book of acts in verse 14 i hope you found it uh 
in this verse, there are some very long words in Greek. Uh, 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 you know how I like this stuff. Uh, not even sure I can pronounce these words, but proskarterontes. Uh, uh, what these words mean, and I've been digging into these words all this week. Uh, they're words that are unusual and hardly ever used in the Bible, but Dr. Luke is uh, using these words, and what they mean is that these Christians scattered all through the city of Jerusalem are devoted to each other in prayer. And they're not stopping. As all of these words, they, they carry this meaning. They are not stopping. They are devoted day in, day out to each other in prayer. And it's cool. Um, this becomes a theme, big theme in the New Testament. The followers of Jesus, they pray for each other. Jesus is forever praying for his disciples. Uh, Paul picks up this theme. And uh, he, you know, Paul travels around. He's raising churches in all these towns in the Mediterranean area, Thessalonica, Ephesus, uh, uh, Philippi, all of these places. And he will sometimes spend maybe even a year in some of these towns. Towns he gets to know these people. They go through hard times. The Jews, the Romans, they uh, go after these poor little Christian people, and, and uh, they become such good friends, close friends, because they have faced hard times together. They've known the beauty of the message of the gospel together. Ah, it's put them on fire. And then see Paul. He moves along to the next town, but he's always and forever writing letters back to people in these towns. And he's always telling them how he is praying for them. And you get the message that he hopes that they are praying for him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, he says, I'm hoping that the love of God is increasing, is abounding in your hearts, in, in, in your love for each other. Ephesians chapter 3, he's saying, I hope that God grants you the strength and the power to be standing firm in Jesus when he comes back again. Uh, in the book of uh, Philippians, he's saying, I hope that you are incre increasing I'm praying that you are increasing in knowledge and insight so that when Jesus comes, you will be standing and ready. Oh, I don't know. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Um, he's praying that God will make you worthy to be standing when Jesus comes, worthy in the righteousness of Jesus. You see what's going on with the early Christian church. These guys are praying, and kind of Paul is right in the middle of it, uh, encouraging everyone to be praying for each other. There's great strength in that. So uh, I want to tell you a story about when I was a kid and working and living up at Pine Springs Ranch. And uh, up at Pine Springs Ranch, it's a Christian summer camp up in the mountains, but my father was the director, and he had this skill uh, of inspiring a spirit in people. And he had this one and only theme, really, and that was that it is exciting, it is cool, it is adventurous to be a Christian. He had a favorite text. It came from the Living Bible, and I think it was Proverbs, Proverbs maybe 14, verse 14. Um, but uh, it says in the Living Bible, the backslider gets bored with himself, but the godly man's life is exciting. And so he could stir this spirit of people and the staff, and he, and he would say, hey, this is what we are teaching these kids that the Christian life is too cool, it's too good, it's too much fun, it's great. And you don't want to miss it. And the staff ah, were into this. And they would see in the lives of these kids, they would see it in their eyes, that they were learning that to be a Christian was fun. 
And it was exciting and it was great. And people's hearts at Pine Springs Ranch were into this. This is what we were doing. It was a mission. But Pine Springs Ranch had a problem and it was their water supply was not strong enough to really conduct that camp and to do it well during a very dry summer. And um, they had a water supply. There was one well down in the ball field and that thing would uh, do okay, especially if it was raining a lot. And up behind the nature center, there was a great ravine that came down out of the mountains. And um, high up in that ravine, high up above the camp, it was a spring, it was a good strong spring. And from that spring that was all rocked in and cemented in, there was about a four inch pipe that, was, that came down and came into a huge water tank that was down right behind the nature center. And uh, you, uh, the, the, the tank was big and you could climb up a ladder and get up on top of that thing and pull up a kind of a trap door and uh, look down in there and it'd usually be full of water, especially in the winter time. And that's where that pipe came out, right at the top of that ladder. And oftentimes, you know, that thing was going strong and uh, all winter long that was going strong. And then there was an overflow out on the other side of the tank and that thing would overflow and start a stream that would go down and go by the cafeteria and everything else. And uh, it was great. And uh, it was great, except for when there was a long, hot, dry summer. And there was a year that came. It was a long, hot, dry summer. And... Uh, I was there and I was working, uh, I was working at the horses plus washing dishes in the cafeteria. So was my brother Tony, so was my cousin Randy, and uh, we were uh, doing okay. But my dad had us checking the level in that water tank. And as the summer was progressing and it was so hot and it wasn't raining, the water level in that tank was going down and it was going down and it was going down. And my dad had us up there two or three times a day. It's a funny thing, you know, we caused so much trouble around that camp. We weren't all that old, you know, 15, 16, 17. And, and uh, he was always thinking of jobs for us to do to kind of keep us off on the perimeter and everything. So we would check the water tank. And the water was going down and it was going down and it was going down. And this was becoming a matter of prayer in the early morning staff meetings. They, everybody could see that the lake, you know, the campfire bowl was built around the lake. And the lake, you know, was normally beautiful and full of water and everything. But now the lake level was going down. That lake was draw, drying up. The water tank up on the hill was drying up. And in, in, in uh, staff worship, we were praying about this. And my dad was bringing up the possibility that we might have to... Uh, Cancel camp. We didn't have enough water. There would be three, sometimes 350, 400 kids at camp. The cafeteria was running two, uh, two uh, shifts for meals. Uh, there was all those kids, maybe 100 staff members. There was horses. To, we had 60 horses up there, and they drank a lot of water. And we had to wash dishes for all these things. And that was Tony and me and Randy. And, huh, and it was turning out to be a long, hot, dry summer. And the whole place was dry and the grass was all dried up and brown. And oh man, and it was down at the horses. We'd be taking horseback trail rides and it was so dusty. And it was just a cloud of dust that would come up and the horses were coughing and sneezing and snorting. But we were doing our best to teach these kids that it was so fun to be a Christian. Oh, it was great. But in camp staff worship, we were praying. Nobody wanted to cancel camp. We had a mission. And so we were especially praying for the counselors that they could just share with these kids, ah, oh, the love, the excitement of being a Christian. And it might not go on, go on forever for all the summer. And we finally came to the last week in July and we were so praying for each other and so uh, so hoping and praying that camp could go on and we could tell this message to more and more kids. Whew. What noise is that? Why I can't learn to turn off my phone. Uh, sorry, but uh, but uh, we would gather together. You know, Uncle Roy would pray. 
pray about the water system. He was a camp caretaker. He's this old guy. Everybody loved him. Uh, Alfred Miyagi would pray. He was the guy who was in charge of the kitchen. Man, he, his heart was into what we were doing just like uh, everybody else. Uh, ah, my little sister Christy was there. She liked to pray. And <laughs> she would pray. Everybody loved to listen to her pray for that water. Pray so earnestly to God. My mom was there. She would pray. The counselors would pray. Everybody would pray. And all through the day, as we were walking around, we'd see each other. And there was a closeness. There was a strength in that camp because we were praying for each other and especially for those counselors. My dad was saying that this week might be the last and he had Tony and Randy and I up at the water tank uh, several times a day and he'd given us this big bucket and in the bucket there was graduations. There was like marked one quart, half gallon, three quarts, a gallon and stuff. And I would go down the ladder uh, just a little ways and the big spout was coming out and uh, uh, Tony or Randy or somebody would time me and they would say go and I would push the bucket under the water spout and hold it there and when a minute was up they'd say stop and I'd pull it out and we'd look <sighs> and we were getting down to like what a half a gallon a minute and uh, what's that you know 30 gallons an hour and that's not enough even though we'd catch up a little bit at nighttime that's not enough to run a camp and the water horses and do their dishes and do everything else. And my dad was telling us in staff worship, we're probably going to have to stop and we're not going to be able to go on uh, next week in camp. And we were just praying, praying for each other, looking at that lake. Man, the lake was dry now, almost completely dry, just algae all over the bottom of the lake. And we'd have campfire and um, looking at this lake, which was usually beautiful, but it wasn't beautiful and it didn't smell good. And um, we could see that things were serious. But there, at the same time, I'm telling you, there was a strength. There was a solidarity. We were shoulder to shoulder and we were praying together. And Friday night came, uh, having campfire, looking at that lake and uh, just hoping, still praying, not really expecting anything. Friday night, and uh, later on going to bed and uh, we actually saw some thunderclouds off in the southwest. We'd seen thunderclouds before that summer. Tony, Randy and I went to, uh, went to bed. We uh, lived up in their old ranch house and there was this big slope that kind of wrapped around there. Over uh, on one side of the slope was where the big tank was and the ravine and everything in the nature center. And then coming around that slope up high there was the old ranch house, that's where we were sleeping, and then coming around a little bit lower was the pool, then going on around the corner, way down below, there's where the lake was. But uh, anyway, we went to sleep. We were sleeping the sleep of the just. We hadn't caused any problems that day at all. We'd been good as angels, not, but we were sleeping away. And uh, so finally, somewhere in the middle of the night, there was a banging and a crashing on our door and the door uh, crashed open to our bedroom and my dad comes rushing in and he says come on you guys get up get up put on some jeans get your boots on come on it's raining and we we looked around yeah you could hear rain thundering outside and we got on our cowboy boots come on and, re and rushed outside and about half the staff was already there and dad was explaining to everybody he says we're digging a ditch we're going to, oh, there's, there was just rivers of water rushing down that hillside, and it was raining so hard. We couldn't believe it. In about two seconds, we were soaking wet. But um, down at the lake, they were starting to dig a dish and trying to ditch and trying to funnel all the water that was rush, rushing down the hillside, funnel it into the lake. So come on, and it's dark, and everybody's working as hard as they can, and some people are holding flashlights. But uh, we jumped in there and people had shovels and hoes and rakes and I don't know, pickaxes and everything else. And they're going away and they're digging a ditch. And you can see that it's already working a little bit and the lake's filling up. And we just jumped in there and started working. And within a few minutes, your Uncle Roy shows up. He's the old caretaker, but he shows up with a tractor and he's got the blade way up on an angle like that. And he's helping dig the ditch that we're doing and he's digging it deeper. And, uh, a few minutes later, uh, my dad can see that that's working well, and so he sends Tony. Tony 
was really good at operating tractors and heavy equipment and stuff. He says, Tony, go down and get the other tractor with the front end loader. Come on, help Uncle Roy. And we're just digging and we're digging and building this berm and the berm's getting high, like three or four feet high. And we're catching water and it's running and yeah, we're out there and it's raining so hard and it's the middle of the night and we're scratching and digging and blisters are getting on our hands. You know, Tony and I, psh, poor Randy, we're running around in jeans and cowboy boots and standing almost knee deep in the water that's rushing down this, uh, this big trough, this big ditch that we're building. We keep building it back up and above the pool underneath the ranch house. We build that ditch all the way past the road and on up and we pretty soon we're catching all the rain that's coming down the ravine that's not going into the tank. And we work and we work and it rained and it rained and all of us are praying that it keeps on raining. And it did. Ah, we worked so hard for three, four, maybe five hours. And finally, it's beginning to get light and the rain is tapering off. Ha! Ah. And that ravine, that water is still just racing down and going into the lake. And we, everybody realizes that, well, better stop. And so we walk all kind of uh, down towards the lake, standing in a group down there, and we can't believe it. The lake is full. Water from the lake is going over the spillway and the dam. Big chunks of algae that have come up from the bottom, they're washing over the spillway, and we just stand there and kind of murmur, we still have that strength, that solidarity we hadn't really thought. You know, we pray, but you don't really think that God's going to answer. And uh, you certainly don't think that if he answers, it's going to mean five or six uh, hours of working like crazy in the middle of the night and getting all wet. But that is what, is, what had happened to us. And we look at that lake. It's full. And Dad's standing down there, and he goes, uh, Alfred Miyagi, he's the kitchen uh, director of the food service. He's there. He's been working like crazy. And uh, Dad goes, well, Alfred, uh, campers are hopefully still asleep. So uh, why don't we draw that out? And uh, can we have breakfast at 11? Line call for breakfast, quarter to 11. And then we'll do the second shift, and that whole thing was organized. So we all kind of sort of went back to bed and everybody kind of drifted off, shocked, stunned. But what had happened? Tony and Randy and I, we went over by the nature center. Let's look at the, let's look at the tank. That's our area. And so we went over there and uh, tank is full. We could see the water and the overflow pouring out. Had to climb the ladder, had to look in. The tank was full up to the top. So, had breakfast at 11 and however those shifts worked. And church service sometime in the afternoon it was a good, 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 good Sabbath. And that whole summer worked and it worked well and we had enough water. And we were able to teach kids that to be a Christian is the most exciting and wonderful thing in the whole world. And that was a gift. But we never lost that oneness, that solidarity. We had been through some stuff and God had been with us. It's the same thing here, you guys, in Oceanside. Yeah, we're scattered around. But uh, we have that strength, and we are praying so much for each other. As a church, we're praying for Richard Maxwell. He's got COVID-19. Oh, man, he's praying for Marilyn, who's taking care of him. His daughter, Katrina, they're in there trying to take care of him and stay uh, healthy. We're praying for the Baker family. You know, uh, Jimmy and Julie Baker's daughter, Alicia, uh, she has COVID-19. She lives in their home. You know, we're praying for them. Uh, we're praying for people like Jonathan Chung, who is so vulnerable right now and just uh, 
trying to stay away and praying for him. We're praying for Haley Buick. We're praying for all of these people and trying to do our best. And we have that solid strength. So, I don't know. I don't know how long this is going to last, but let's keep going. God's going to be with us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father, thank you that we can be together and devoted to each other in prayer. Pray that uh, you'll bless us. Be with Richard and Marilyn Maxwell and with the Bakers and with Halia and with all the other people that we're praying for. I pray that uh, you'll bless us as we try to get back together face to face uh, with this church family and to have our church services together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.